Hi everyone, this is two-time World Poker Tour champion Jonathan Little, and I want to tell you about my training site, PokerCoaching.com. Poker Coaching is the place to be if you want to increase your poker skills and learn to crush the games. It's the only place to quickly increase your win rate with active learning, so you can achieve your full poker potential without having to hire an expensive coach. Right now, podcast listeners can score a free membership by visiting pokercoaching.com slash card player and get access to top training tools like our interactive hand quizzes, our 7, 14, and 30-day challenges, and a roster of elite coaches such as Matt Affleck, James Romero, Burt Draftganger Stevens, Michael Acevedo, and dozens of others. Again, that's pokercoaching.com slash card player to get your free membership right now. By now, you've heard about Global Poker, one of the fastest growing online card rooms available in the US and Canada today. So what's stopping you from trying it out? Global Poker is a safe and secure social poker site that uses their own patented sweepstakes model. Signing up is easy. You can use Google, Facebook, or just an email address. You can always play for free on Global Poker, but you can also buy gold coins for additional play, which will earn sweeps coins that can be redeemed for real cash to a bank account, Skrill account, or even as a gift card. Get a free 5,000 gold coins when you sign up right now at GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales, both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 146 and features Steven Song, who has been absolutely tearing up the tournament circuit over the last few years. The New York-born, Greenwich, Connecticut-raised pro started his run in 2019 by winning his second WSOP circuit ring, and then followed that up with three wins in the summer. Not only did he score victories at the Seminole Hard Rock Poker Open and EPT Barcelona, but he also picked up his first career gold bracelet at the World Series of Poker, taking down a 1K no limit event for $342,000. The next year he again went deep at the Summer Series, settling for third place in a $1,500 no limit event, while also bagging his third circuit ring at a stop in Los Angeles. But 2022 was by far Song's best year, with final tables at the Hard Rock Poker Showdown, Venetian Deep Stack Championship, Poker Masters, and Windfall Classic. The former chess prodigy also had a runner-up at the WSOP for $477,000, and then in December, he won the massive 5,430-player World Poker Tour Prime Championship at Win, banking a personal best $713,000. The win was not only enough to put Song over the $5 million mark in career tournament earnings, but it also was enough to make him the 2022 GPI Player of the Year. He would also finish third in card players' POI rankings, just behind high roller Stephen Chidwick and Fareed Jatton. Anyway, that is enough intro. Here is my conversation with Stephen Song. I am here with Stephen Song. Stephen, how you doing? Hey, doing well. What's up, my man? The GPI Player of the Year for 2022. Uh, did pretty damn good in our own contest as well how you feeling these days uh feeling good i mean definitely blessed to uh, you know be able to play a game for a living and obviously mm. uh running in the top percentile for you know tournament poker that's for sure uh yeah just uh all around blessed for sure Right. Well, when you're the best player in the world, you can say things, you know, like, oh, it's it's such a, a thrill to be playing a game for a living, right? But what, what, about yeah. the stresses? what about the stresses that come with playing a game for a living? You know what I mean? How, yeah, are those I mean, those are in check these days, huh? Yeah. So obviously running really hot and get in the right spots will help that. But sure, with poker, there's just tons of variance and that adds a bunch of stress, obviously. Um, but 
me and my friends, we've been playing long enough where it's kind of just a volume game where, you know, the more volume you put in, uh, the easier it is to balance out. Assuming that you're hopefully a winning player. Of course. No yeah. one really knows. That's that's the issue of poker, uh, tournament poker at least. There's not I, enough uh, um, sample size in a lifetime live. <laughs> I mean, there there could be, but you don't really know. Like, it's possible to be a deviation of someone who's, like, a very good player who just never wins and someone who's, like, maybe not a great player who never loses, right? Uh, Well, we will get to that crazy volume you put in for sure in a little while. In this show, we like to go back to the beginning. Um, Let's talk about where you grew up and how you found the poker world. You were born in New York? Uh, Yeah, born in New York. Uh, lived there for two years, then moved to London for about four to five years, and then moved back to the States and uh, raised in Connecticut. So and, what was uh, the parents doing to, to make those moves happen? Uh, my dad was uh, working in a hedge fund, and then he started running his own hedge fund. Uh, and he ended up closing that, I think, in 20... 15? 2014? And then moved over to real estate. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it was his job that brought us to London and back to Connecticut. Yeah, both stock exchanges. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, and um, what were you getting into as a kid? Brothers or sisters? Uh, I have two little sisters. I was always actually really into strategy games. So as a kid, uh, I was introduced to chess pretty early on, and I actually. Uh, did some coaching and stuff, and when I was like, I would like say, you no, know, nine or ten years old in London, I was like top twenty in the country. Now that sounds really impressive, but I guess for London, it's easy, it's less competition than places like America and other places around the world, but still something pretty cool, and it kind of you know, guided my path towards like strategy games. So it all kind of makes sense now. Yeah, there's a huge overlap between chess and poker uh especially these days you know you get magnus carlson coming and entering poker tournaments all the time now um you know what 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 is the connection that you see there i think it's all about just well chess is way more punishing uh well i guess poker and chess are both punishing in their own ways you could uh do well for a long time but one silly mistake can really just cost you everything and I think that uh, level of concentration throughout the whole time uh, helps on both ends of poker and chess. Uh, yeah, definitely just really punishing whenever you make a mistake. And uh, But also the both, luck aspect of it, right? Because there's not really luck well, in there's chess. Well, no, there's no luck aspect in chess. So when you lose, it's your own fault. In poker, exactly. at least you can chalk it up to bad luck or when you are make a bad play you can also be bailed out so it goes both ways um but typically uh with how good technology is now you can just plug in anything you did and the computer will just tell you if you're wrong or right which is basically like chess too well that's right yeah. solvers have basically chessified poker in a in a very very yeah, small really way is. so far uh how did you learn chess back in the day was it just book reading or? Yeah, I can't really remember, but I uh, I think I played a little in uh, pre K, and uh, got into it, was playing on the chess team, and I think my uh, chess coach told my parents that I should look into getting a coach and taking it more seriously, and yeah, then I started doing that, and I guess around the when I moved to America, around the age of like. nine or ten i kind of i guess i kind of uh my parents were told that i would have to play two hours a day to stay competitive and they were just like we don't have the time for that so that's kinda a lot for a kid. Of, <laughs> yeah so transition to that out of that and was playing soccer pretty competitively because i played that in london and obviously soccer anywhere but america is really competitive so mm-hmm. when i did transition when i did move to america being average in London, I was like above average in America, so I kind of oh, that's funny. That you just, for a little, <laughs> you just yeah. traded, the, 
traded the rare the rarefied skill in each uh, region. <laughs> yeah. Well, what was uh growing up in in Greenwich, Connecticut like? Uh, you know that has, the city has a has a uh, reputation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, super blessed. My parents did really well and was able to give us a ton of opportunities. Um, I was never really that into school, just because I would, I would kind of get bored. But uh, my parents were able to keep me on track at least. But for some reason, I always knew that school just wasn't really my thing, uh, which I ended up eventually dropping out in uh, college in 2015. Um, what, uh, where were you in college, and what were you pretending to study? <laughs> Yeah, well, no, it was a, it was actually uh, first semester of freshman year. Uh, I was gonna go into something in econ just to make money. I was at a uh, Colby College, which I got into for squash, which uh, oh. I later switched from soccer to squash, which is a, uh, it's basically like racquetball but a little different. That is and a Connecticut ass sport to be getting. Yeah, a scholarship it is in. <laughs> definitely a super white sport too. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I, I actually uh, got into it because my parents were talking to some of their friends, and they said, hey, look, yeah. this is a really good way to get into colleges. And it's like a lifetime sport. I still play yeah. once in a blue moon uh, when I get the chance. Oh, yeah. But, uh, uh, hard player columnist uh, Bernard Lee was had, was telling me he just picked it up and uh, was getting really competitive. In uh, Yeah, his... yeah, no, it's a great sport for sure. And, uh, it's great for fitness, too. All right, so you get back into it actually. What what were your uh, any any soccer or squash glory days stories? I mean, not so much glory days. I trained a lot, so then I was eventually pretty. High. I think at peak for under nineteen, I was like top fifty for a little while. But uh, obviously, not ha- don't have to compete with that many people just because squash is more of a niche <laughs> sport. So I'm competing with a you know a bunch of you know. I mean, they're still good athletes, but the, like a lot of the best athletes go to all the other sports. Right, they don't exactly. Have to compete with them, right? What if LeBron James put his all into squash? Yeah, he'd have to be number one, right? <laughs> that guy's just a superhuman. But thankfully, I have to compete with uh, those kind of guys. Have they even ever had a player of that like size and ability? Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that'd be crazy. Uh, there, oh. there definitely are some really athletic guys who like um, go purely off athletics, but no yeah. like superhuman level like someone like LeBron or some of these yeah. football guys. Right? But, so when does poker come into the picture? Because you're 27. Yeah. Obviously, the poker boom's happening when you're still a kid. Yeah. So when I was about like, I would say like. 10, 11 ish. Uh, my, me and my dad were watching on TV, uh, just like old poker reruns. And when I was 11, that was what? Or 10, that was 17 years ago. 2006. 2006, so, right. Okay, so that was the, that must have been the Jamie Gold year. But I you, remember. Either, either you were watching Greg Raymer repeats or. Yeah, it was Greg Raymer. Well, yeah. Money. Well, Moneymaker for sure. I actually don't yeah. think I watched Jamie Gold's here for a little while, but I had seen Moneymaker and Raymer. Oh, um, Hashem. Hashem was 2005. Oh, Hashem. Hashem. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then 2004 was Raymer. Oh, Raymer. Hashem was the year I watched. I do yeah. remember that with Steve Daneman, who uh, got second. Um, right. But that was the year that I learned how to play poker my dad who was way better than me at the time. We would sometimes play heads up for like penny stakes mm-hmm. and he would beat me every time. <laughs> we were playing like one penny, two penny, but every time he would beat me, it was super <laughs> pressuring. He's uh, going to make you earn it. <laughs> yeah. But then eventually I got into it uh, with my high school friends and uh, I was also playing a little bit online, not uh, on any real money sites, but I was playing like through side games, on, like I would play this game Puzzle Pirates, and poker was a side game of it. Oh, and okay. That's where I played a lot, and I actually, uh, when I was first going pro, and I couldn't make it on the real sites, I went back to that site just to, you know, prove that I was still better than some people. And <laughs> I would like sell confidence. that money. 
Yeah, I sell that money for real world money. I actually made like 200 bucks from uh, selling in-game money, which is pretty cool. Uh, but wow. it was like, uh, yeah, it was, it's small, but like at the time it was a lot of money and it was a way to like get the confidence up. But that was way later when I had dropped out of uh, college and was trying to pursue it full time with uh, one of my good buddies, Derek Sudell. We dropped out at the same time. He actually still plays. He plays uh, like 501k, no limit online, uh, but he's really good. Um, yeah, and he was actually my first like quote unquote coach in the beginning because when I first dropped out, I didn't, I was kind of just in no man's land doing whatever. He was the one who kind of taught me, hey, look, you can't just like play ridiculous. You have to like have some kind of overall strategy while playing, and it makes it way easier to play too. Uh, it's different points to um... think about. You were an all field player back then. Uh, definitely back back then. But uh, my buddy Derek, he's he's the one who definitely helped me like with strategy, like one hands to open, like three bet, etc. Like how to play hands post flop. Um, yeah, I mean everyone has to start from scratch. I I used to be awful back in the day. Actually, I remember uh, playing in ignition during college because during college I was starting to play on the real money sites. Uh, there was one, like, I would get really bored. These are like $1, $2 terms, but I would get really bored. And if I didn't like how my stack was dwindling, I would just shove. And usually <laughs> anything between, anything other than tw- under 20 bigs, I'd be like, I'd be like, all right, I'm getting way too short. And just like rip ridiculous hands from early positions. So like, no one's ever going to call. So like, I remember specifically the last time I did it, I shoved queen seven off for like 20 bigs, something ridiculous from EP. And someone woke up with jacks, and I ended up hitting a queen, and that guy nonstop raided me in the chat <laughs> forever. And I was like, maybe that isn't a good play. And then I, and then Derek was like, yeah, you can't be doing that. And I was like, okay, stop doing that. But uh, just like, <laughs> it was just uh, utter chaos in the beginning with how I was playing. Late, later, I was able to like become a little more disciplined and you know, not be as crazy. Um, actually, I do think that making a crazy player good is significantly easier than making a very conservative player good because making a crazy player good, they're already used to playing all these uncomfortable hands. If you just tell, tell them, Hey, just fold a couple times. It makes it really easy for them because now they're already used to being in uncomfortable situations with the bad hands that they're playing. Yeah. Whereas when someone's on the conservative side, you're like, Hey, you have to open these hands. Now they're being forced into uncomfortable situations where they're not used to having you know, these marginal hands. Whereas on the right. other spec- spectrum, like you're way too crazy. Now you're playing the hands that make sense. It's way easier, right? Because you've already forced yourself in these. Like the amount of times, like in back in the day, where I'd be betting the turn with a hand, where I'm like, okay, if I get called, I literally can't win unless I bluff them off. Right. Like that's just not, like, and I'm like, why am I even in this hand pre-flop? I've like eight, three suited for no reason, which should have been folded. And now I'm on the turn with this like, huge ass pot and he's called and now the river's coming in. I have to bluff if I want to win the pot. You know, that's a lot more stressful than just like being selective and, you know, playing math. Right. But, but at hand, least right? you can physically pull the trigger. You've done it before, as opposed to somebody. Yeah. That, who's that knitting it up to too. start, you know what I mean? Oh, if sure, you, if you sure. start as a knit, it takes forever to pry your hand of those chips, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, and that, that is a big issue too. And the crazy guy, and especially in a tournament format, like in the cash game format, I think being a knit is really good because naturally in rakes environments, you have to be a knit. But in the tournament format where there's antis and, you know, no rake per pot and... Uh, and the blinds are constantly going up, like being crazy, like even if you're bad, you can actually just run up a stack and still win. It's it's much more likely to win a tournament being bad as a crazy player than as a super net, right? Let's talk about your first recorded tournament score, uh, which has a cool story behind it. Um, this yeah, is a, turning this stone. is a, a win a turning stone in October yeah. 2016. For a little under $33,000. Yeah, uh, that was a huge day. So I had played a couple of live tournaments uh, that weren't recorded <coughs> down in Florida when I was under 18 or under 21. 
because it's 18 and over. And mm-hmm. I actually won two uh, $100 dailies for like, I think one was 2.5K and one was like 3,300. And those are huge for me. Um, uh, but because my parents had a deal where I had to consistently, I had to pay back uh, my college debt. Because their deal was, look, if you just get all B's and make it through college, we'll pay. But if not, then you're responsible for whatever semesters you can get all B's. And obviously I dropped out mid semester, so didn't get all B's and kind of wasted that whole semester. So I had to pay that semester of college back to my parents, which is more than fair. Uh, I knew the terms when I uh, dropped <laughs> out and didn't, you know, yeah. Um, but anyways, I had to pay back 30 K and it was tough. Cause even when I was making money, I'd constantly have to, we were doing 1K a month that I was paying them. So even though I'm trying to build a role, and this is when I'm not a very good player either, so it's hard enough to build a role when you're not a good player. Right. You have to constantly be paying back your, uh, the pressure of paying back your college tuition at the same time. You know, that was pretty stressful. Um, at the time, me and my buddy Derek Sudell, who also cashed a tournament, uh, we he had just done really well. He had like won a tournament for... 2k and 10k online pretty recently and i had won my uh hundred dollar live tournaments in florida and at the time after paying back uh i think my role was around like 1k after (laughs) i had paid back about like 15k um but i had like a 1k roll and we made this drive to turning stone the first night we drove at night and we were like Look, well, like, because we need to save money. We get, we're basically broke at this point. Like, what, ourselves are broke. We still live with our parents and everything's okay. But us ourselves, we don't have that much money. So we drove up in his car. We slept, we spent the night in the car. Actually, what we did first is we drove up just to make the $130 satellite to the 570. <laughs> uh, it was a 570 100K main. That was the big event of the week. We drove up, uh, like the night before and there was a satellite at night and I think it was $130 to the 570 and me and Derek both played it. And we were actually two of the three people who got seats. I guess one of the five got seats. And it was, uh, it was awesome. Uh, I mean, poker was so soft back then. Uh, I remember the satellite one, it, the big one was 800 and one guy tosses in a one K chip and says raise. And <laughs> we were like to 1600. And he's like, no, no, to one K. And just at 400, wow. 800. And we were like, what is going on here? And then <laughs> later we talked to this guy because he ended up not getting the seat, but his buddy did. And they were both like, yeah, we're going to play the main event this year. And we were like, what the heck? Like, is this just how poker is? You know, like guys who like, don't even know the <laughs> rules are ready to play like a 10K tournament. But um, uh, this is like the glory days when it was super soft. Anyways, we both satellite in. We sleep in the car that night. Horrible sleep, obviously. It's freezing upstate New York. This is like you know, close to winter. Uh, and we, the, that morning we go to our Airbnb's place. We finally get a little bit of sleep, go play the tournament. Uh, we both swap 20% in the tournament for our bullet. Uh, and as we're playing, Oh, sorry. Actually, after, uh, after we had both, uh, sided in, we played two five cash. He ended up, I mean, he ran top set into a flop straight for like in a big three bet pot and got stacked. Uh, my buddy Derek, but I sun ran. I made like one k somehow with my with my one k roll. I sat at two five like an idiot because <laughs> three was too boring for me, and I made like one k. So I was having a decent uh, trip. We uh, sleep, go to the tournament, swap twenty percent. He. Or I end up busting playing awfully. Uh, this guy, Evan Shahanasi, he still plays, but this guy just beat me in every pot and just completely owned me. Whether he was like, whether he was like shoving all in at the fold or whether he kept on calling my bluffs. And then finally he busted me out with quads. I was like, all right, I'm out. <laughs> so I go to play the 2 5 game because obviously I'm a degenerate and 1 3 is too small. So with my $1,500 roll, I go play 2 5. Uh, but the list was too long and I looked at Reg and I could still get in from like 30 bigs. And I was like, you know what? Like 
I'm already here. I might as well play. <laughs> like this, this list is. There was like eight people on the list. I'm like, all right, the list is too long. I was like, screw it. And I'm like, hey, Derek, I'm gonna go play. Do you want a piece? Derek, knowing how like mediocre I was at the time, was like, nah, I'm good. Um, I'm like, okay, Oof. so go play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go play the tournament. Right after I sit, they call for a new two five. So if I had waited a little longer, I would have just played two five and skipped the tournament. Ben said I play the tournament that and that tournament I end up winning and he actually ends up cashing so I get twenty percent of his cash but he didn't buy the action brutal. so he gets uh, zero that's brutal but he, yeah and I, I oh I just looked it up it. yeah, yeah. He, he cashed for like seven hundred bucks <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man. That's hilarious. Oh. You take home thirty three thousand. I mean, yeah. If you if you waited two minutes, got called for that two five game. I'm not talking to you right now. Maybe you know. No, no. Everything's way different, and uh, maybe I mean, my either, parents well, are still either not, way, not let me even play. Or yeah, it's crazy how things work, right? Either like, way, it was really a third of that. your bankroll. <laughs> I mean, it was yeah, yeah. For the five, yeah, for the five seventy, yeah, it was ridiculous that I even played that, but. I don't know. Sometimes it's just being chosen at the right moment uh, can just change your career. Um, and that obviously was huge. Right after that, we were all confident. And then we took a trip down to Florida. And uh, I ended up getting second in that, uh, I think it was a 360 bounty tournament. But I was down like 3K in tournaments uh, before that. I paid off my debt and then we were playing online all the time still, but then, yeah, I took that trip to Florida and almost had another disastrous trip at the last second, like pulled out a second place in that uh, bounty tournament for a reasonable profit. Although I did lose, like I had a 10 to one chip lead heads up and I still lost to Rob Cohen, who I actually, uh, it's funny. I see him and play with him all the time today. He, uh, he's a sicko now. He won the, he's insane at PLO. He won the 50 K PLO, but uh, it's funny how like guys like I, get a heads up in a $360 tournament. I still see right. uh, playing all the big stuff with me. It's crazy how um, everyone's grown. Uh, yeah. He's a sicko in PLO. I always see that guy's name everywhere in the, yeah, in the yeah. He's, tournaments. he's nuts for sure. All right. Uh, so let's go through, uh, through some of the, high- well, first of all, what did you, what did your parents say when you came in and you dropped a sack of cash on the table and said, oh, my debt is g- clear. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were thrilled. They were also like, on the phone the whole time they were like have security walk you back it's so don't get in cash what are you thinking i was like i have to get in cash i still have a picture of uh my you know three bands thinking i was the the man like it was more money than i'd ever seen you know (laughs) um yeah i mean it was just an unreal feeling for sure it was like kind of the start of like all right this is actually possible because i would say that I, i was like a reasonably smart kid back then but like I knew that people were making mistakes. I just didn't see myself making mistakes. It wasn't until the, I became more self-aware is when I started improving. But I could tell that people around me were making like big mistakes, and we're like at the time, like you know, five hundred seventy bucks. That's a lot of money. And I'm like looking at these guys. I'm like, these guys are just like, you know, they're just sticking around. There should be a lot of money to be made at these. Uh, these tournaments, right? Or just poker in general. Like, when you well, it's so one, three and two, five tables. Like, it's so, so crazy, much money, um, game, right? Perspective, right? Because you're 27, you know, and you're look in 2016, you literally, I think you said you called it the glory days back when poker was still soft. Isn't that what you said? Yeah. Like, do you understand how, yeah, like, I, how I, I much like panic? Glory day. No, I'm like, saying like how much panic the pros were having in 2016, saying the game is solved, we're screwed, everyone's too good yeah. now. That's some, like people yeah. were saying that the pros were saying that in 2010, they were saying poker's solved, everyone, you know, uh, everyone's too tough, you can't beat the rake, and and here you come six years later, and you're saying this is the softest it'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's all yeah that's all we really knew yeah um, i mean online was always reasonably uh tough so uh it was mostly just live poker at this the places i played so like you know turning stone wherever i played there or like south florida like florida is just like you know very soft i would say um but turning stone and foxes especially too 
uh, that's where I started playing live more at uh, Foxwoods. But um, yeah, I had a pretty interesting poker journey, I guess. So that happened and that kind of put us on the map to play a, a ton of online volume. And then I ended up meeting, uh, do you know Ricky Guan? Uh, yes. So Derek and me went up to Turning Stone January and I min cash some 250 there, but we ended up meeting him and he connected us to uh, my now roommate, Michael Rosito, who was a WSP boy in 1993 online. And we had played so much online and we would sweat tables when we were out of the tournaments too. And this guy was grinding hard and he would, he would always win too. So me and Derek were like, Oh my God, you know, this guy. So then we all got in the group chat together. And when we were like, we would play all the time and we would just, uh, get on uh, video call or not uh, voice call. And we'd just be talking to each other while sweating each other's runs. It became really fun. And uh, Ricky actually got me my first backer after I got second in the 1650 uh, mega stack of foxes for like 40 K Ricky got me, me a backing deal through his backer. He was able to convince him to believe in me. And that summer when I was 21, I got to play a full summer of Vegas tournaments. Um, that it was the dream. Uh, it was insane. And it was me, Ricky and Mike and the three of us were staying in this really shitty Airbnb for like, I think we got it for like, I think it was like 800 per person for the whole series or something crazy <laughs> like that. Uh, but it was really shitty. It was two rooms and it was supposed to be three rooms, but there was like a mirror that looked like another room, but it was just a mirror that just showed <laughs> the room. So we got two rooms. We were like, what the fuck? They're like, all right, we'll give you an air mattress. But I honestly, we were also happy to be there that we didn't really care. So I slept on the air mattress the whole summer. Um, just to pay less too. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that was an incredible experience of being 21 to be able to play my first, you know, full summer and got to play the main event that year. Uh, it was just a dream come true. Actually, that summer I actually had a pretty good score. It's wrong on Hen and Mob, but I chopped the Venetian 800 or 600 for like 80 something K. It was, it was the amount that I cash for was actually uh, a little more than second place, but uh, it's it's all wrong on the head and mob. They screwed it up. But uh, yeah, that summer I chopped a turn for like 80k, and that's when my parents were like, "Okay, maybe you know this isn't like just a waste of time." Because when I at there first initially shirt. dropped out, they were super against it, and my mom especially. My dad was more so on my side because he had gone through a blackjack phase, so he was like, "You know, maybe there is some hope." My mom was super against it, but obviously the big wins are, you know, will be like, will make them be like, okay, maybe this is somewhat viable. Well, I imagine your dad as a as a hedge fund guy, you know, he doesn't see much difference between <laughs> the gambling on each side of it. I'm sure, you know, you're you're putting money in and hoping to get more back. It's the same thing. Yeah, right? yeah. Although with poker, it's a lot different because with hedge fund, you're gambling with other people's money. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's your own money. Although then I did get back, and that helped them. Uh, you know, then it was like, okay, at least you're not losing your own money when you're putting up these, like, you know. I mean, it was a lot of buy-ins. I think I put up like probably like 50k of buy-ins the first uh, my first summer. I can't afford that on my own. If I if I was on my own, I might have not. I might have gone for like a week or maybe a week or two, but I definitely would have gone the, for the full thing. Uh, yeah, it was just an yeah. incredible experience. To we have fast that forward. Uh, oh, sorry. We fast forward six months to the World Poker Tour event at Borgata, the Winter Poker Open, where yeah, you so that, the final table. That was really cool. So at the time, uh, I'd say like two months prior, I was on, or like a couple months prior, maybe like three months prior, I was on the worst downswing. I mean, I'd barely been playing, but I was, I think I was down like, or I had like uh, at 1.65 K in makeup, uh, through the backing deal. And I was feeling really distraught and all I, I remember at peak, I drove over to Fox's to play some like one K hundred K six max and min cash was 2,800 and first place was like, uh, somewhere around 30 K and I stone bubbled 
I got like 19th when 18th pay, 18 uh, people cash. I stone bubble. I remember driving home that night thinking like, am I ever going to make this money back? Uh, fast forward to Borgata, I had uh, gotten second in boxes again. I had gotten a couple other scores. So I'd gotten the makeup down to around like 15, 20K ish. And uh, the way I uh, was doing my backing deal was I was trying to buy pieces of myself to keep myself motivated. I was like, how am I supposed to be motivated playing a $400 tournament when you know, first place mm. can't even clear, right? So I was like, look, let me just like buy 10% of myself, auto buy 10% of myself just to have me have some skin in the game. And my backer would obviously love that too, because, you know, he wants me to try harder and it doesn't make too much of a difference to him. And for the Borgata main, I remember I was on my third bullet and the way it worked is first bullet, he had 90%. Second bullet, I could buy another 10% and third bullet, I could buy another 10% because you know, the ROI is lower when you buy it later. People didn't know about the max late regging thing at this point. So they just assumed that it was just always, always be a worse buy. So I actually yeah. had 30% of myself in the last bullet of that uh, WPT that I ended up getting sixth in. And uh, yeah, it was really incredible. Unfortunately, I'd been texting my backer the whole time. And two days prior, my backer, like I would say Dave four-ish like beginning of day four my backer stopped texting i was like okay that's odd and then i made the final table and on the day of the final table i found out that he's actually passed away in his sleep no um, way yeah it's uh crazy this guy alex from florida i had only met him once but he was a really cool dude uh it's really unfortunate because he had a family and stuff but he just passed away in his sleep i think it was just from health issues i'm not exactly sure but uh Anyways, I ended up getting sixth in the tournament, and because I had cleared, we were able to send his family the money uh, for their profit split. So that was really good. Uh, wow. It worked out well for it worked out well for my case because I cleared just in time. For other people, he had big outstanding makeup numbers, and I think people just bought out for like ten cents on the dollar just to give the family, you know, so because the family's not going to run it, right? So, right that's um, the other thing like you know once once he's gone i mean you know and who's making the decisions yeah and then yeah how do you keep um, it going wow that's a big yeah, risk yeah you really can't yeah it just was kind of a disaster but that's but, awesome um, that you were able to come through it not only yeah I, and not did that only but put money in your pocket yeah got, i had 30 percent of my own action plus the uh, the remaining 70 percent whatever i cleared and then profit split i got you know I think it was 40, 40, I got a 40, 60 deal in the beginning, which now, nowadays everything's 50, 50, but when you're a 21 year old kid with like no credentials, you'll take anything you can get if you can play like a full summer and just like be fully backed. Right. Yeah. So 40, 60, uh, and I had my own money to like actually play. And I remember after that tournament, my parents were fine. Cause my mom had been forcing me to like take classes. She was trying to get me to like do errands for her constantly uh, my parents were trying to teach me the real estate business and they were like, okay, fine. We'll let you focus on only poker. And that was from 2017 or 2018 onward, I guess. Um, where I just focused on only poker. So traveling a ton, uh, to different circuit stops. I mean, the circuit was great just cause there were so many different terms you could play. And, uh, I would say the fields were pretty damn soft. And I think the reason why is because when, like this, when a circuit would come to an area, this would be like the time of the year where, you know, where the the one time of the year where the circuit comes to the area and all the poker players are super happy and excited, right? It's going to be tough to play your best poker knowing that this little portion is like all you have, like this is your only chance. And then after this, the rest of the year is just normal. Like maybe there'll be a daily every once in a while. But as a pro... Right you get to play knowing that like, okay, sure. Even if this series doesn't work out, I just play my best. And there's always another series to Brian. And I think that advantage is huge for pros versus recreationals in their mindsets. I think recreationals will be like, well, look, I'm not playing a tournament for like a long time after this. I might as well like have fun while I play or like, I don't want to blind out. So I'll just like take this, like, you know, minus EV shove just cause I don't want to, I want to chip up and I want to, stay live in this thing right or vice versa like i don't want to blow it because like i might not get i'm not going to get a chance to play for another year right 
like this is the only time I play real tournaments is when the circuit comes around. Um, right. So you're I talking, that, uh, uh, you're talking about places like Hammond, Indiana, Lake Tahoe. Yeah. You know, Tahoe. Ch- Cher- and Cherokee. Like Tunica yeah. And Cherokee. And, yeah. I mean, Cherokee is a little different cause it happens so often, but like places like really out in the woodworks. Like, yeah. So um, you, um, you know, you build a bunch of big final tables. You, you want a circuit ring. Um, you want a couple circuit rings, to start there, I think you just picked up your third not too long ago as well. Um, yeah. So w- what was that like, getting the circuit ring? I mean, circuit rings were really cool. Uh, it wasn't, a, like, bracelet level, but it was definitely just an accomplishment of something that I could, you know, check off my list. Uh, just something I, like, another thing that I've done in the yeah. world, right, to, like, pad my poker resume. Uh, also, just winning a tournament just feels so good, especially live. It's so hard to win a live tournament just because you, know, you don't get to play that many throughout the year and the variance is so insane. So just winning it outright is just like such a cool feeling. Do you feel so that, um, and, do you like your record heads up? Uh, I actually have a lot of seconds. I'd say heads up. I typically run not that great in the situations where I like, in the hand and circuit main, I got an ace king versus ace. I mean, I don't want to start the bad beats, but uh, <laughs> I got ace king, ace king versus ace jack, and I had all myself. And like, we're playing for like 50k basically, and we got it in for like 90% of the chips in play, and he spiked the jack, and he ends up winning. Uh, and then even this, uh, the recent Venetian ones, I got it in 70 30 a couple times, heads up in both the. Uh, the 5k and the 15k and i lost every time but i mean heads up to so much variance so i've you know i've learned not to take it too hard just getting second in a tournament is uh feels good enough you just have to, you have to run good enough to just get second in a tournament so even like i don't really get too sour when i get second versus first uh the money obviously sucks because like when you do get second that's the biggest pay jump so you miss the biggest pay jump but um yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully, just for all the, because I think all the biggest spots I've gotten first in typically, besides the five k six match. That's uh, true. That's true. Uh, that's probably the, the 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 closest call that it went the wrong way, huh? Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's talk about the bracelet though. You know, two thousand nineteen. It's a one k at the series, huge field, and you take it down for three hundred forty thousand dollars. I mean, yeah, that's. Yeah. Life that was changing, super, right? That was super sick because uh, the week before there was a six hundred dollar WSOP tournament with like six thousand entries, and I got twelfth, and I was devastated. I was like, I might never have <laughs> this kind of chance ever again. Like this run at a bracelet, and then like literally a week later, I freaking win a one k for like three forty. So uh, I mean, that whole series is freaking nuts. Um, yeah, that was incredible. Uh, Curable time. My dad also, unbeknownst to me at the time, when I, I, because I found when I we got to the final six, I probably had like sixty percent of the chips in play because I just aces over queens, second in chips, like cool, cooler the fuck out of him. So that was pretty sweet. <laughs> um, and I guess my mom booked a flight for my dad that morning, and because of the time difference, it's easy for him to get over. And while I was playing, then uh, before I was playing, I saw my dad, and it was like the coolest thing ever i got to run up i hadn't seen him uh give him a hug i hadn't seen him in you know uh months because i was traveling all the time and then i went to play the series and during the summer i'm just in vegas the whole time uh and for him to be able to watch me win the bracelet it was just unreal Um, yeah that's that's amazing what did you uh do with the bracelet did you you have it displayed anywhere uh yeah it's all it's all in my parents house all my trophies and stuff are uh they they have like a wall for me for <laughs> my poker stuff uh yeah they they love that stuff so i just uh always give it to them was a bracelet you know big on your bucket list coming up or you know was it all about the money uh well at the time it was uh mostly about the money because i just wanted uh you know financial freedom uh, for the most part, I kind of want to just be like stress free. So the money was huge. The bracelet was always a goal, but as once you like play enough poker, you come to the realization that like, you know, there's a ton of variance and 
you know, it's hard to win tournaments and to win like a tournament with a lot of money at the top that also has a bracelet. Like, like if it doesn't happen, so be it, right. It's probably not going to happen, but you know, the times that it does, you really have to just know how special it is and how lucky and fortunate you are at that time for sure. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, it's awesome. Bracelet's wow. always been a lifelong goal for I think almost any poker player who got into it during the WSOP rerun era, where uh, you know WSOP was just the place. It was I I watched a little bit of WPT, but I basically watch solely WSOP reruns and uh, just mainly of the main event. Uh, but yeah, bracelets were definitely the most coveted at the time. Now we have I think. To, uh... No, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, now as a professional, I think WPTs are more coveted just because there's fewer of them. Um, and they're just harder to get because, you know, well, uh, they're just way more sporadic. They'll be like maybe in Florida sometimes or maybe a couple times in LA and just not that many. Whereas bracelets, they just pump them out now. <laughs> so. Did you uh, hear the news of they're going to be 95, I think, live bracelets this year? Man. I mean, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> 95 and then plus, yeah, you know, plus the online, plus the online plus series. Plus the online series, yeah. Plus Europe. <laughs> oh, and yeah, then, that too. And now you can win a bracelet just by beating players in Michigan or. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. Or Pennsylvania, right? Or, yeah. De- or Delaware. I don't even know. Anyway, uh, yeah, so, you know, you're right. There's a scarcity thing uh, where. You know, there's just not enough WPT events for everyone to have a title, so. Yeah, for sure. We'll get to WPT in a second. We're going to have to zoom through your accomplishments here because uh, we're running <laughs> out of time. But, you know, you, yeah. go, you go down to the Hard Rock. You take down a 10K, which had to be crazy, for 285K. You go to Barcelona on the EPT. You win another side event for another 200K. Yeah, um, you know, going down to Florida, making more final tables. you just racking them up. You know. To, uh, you know, we, we fast forward to 2022, 44 caches. I, I mean, I, I didn't even play 44 tournaments. 40, <laughs> yeah. 44 caches. Uh, yeah, I was actually uh, looking a little uh, for the call, and I think I have around, like, probably, like, uh, 190 to 200 bullets fired. Wow. <laughs> like, of like tournaments uh yeah it's pretty crazy actually it so, might be 234 but still that's almost a, 238 like a, sorry that's like a 20 percent isn't it like 20 percent cash rate something like that oh yeah my cash rate was uh way above uh ev for sure yeah so that was uh, so, super cool so when you look at your numbers like that for the year are you going to yourself okay i really am you know this much above uh, the average player, or are you going to yourself? It should have been this. I need to expect lower in other future years, or you know, how how does that work? Because as a poker player, I imagine you're always trying to balance confidence and also realistic expectations. Yeah, so I definitely because uh, after my 2019 year in 2020 and uh, some of 2021, uh, or after that. Uh, Barcelona, I actually went on a pretty uh, sizable downswing where uh, at the time my confidence was sky high before and then to go on the biggest downswing of my life. Uh, I think I went on like a 150 to 200k downswing of my own money and uh, yeah, that didn't feel good, but it kind of set some expectations for this next uh, super heater I've had that, you know, it, it, it doesn't just stay this easy. It's how poker works. You're going to have to you know, lose a lot back. It's just how the game, how the game is. It's just how variance works, right? No one uh, just gets lucky for forever. So I definitely have ex- like you know, set expectations of like, look, don't be an idiot and just start firing unresponsibly just because I think I'm the sickest ever. This is just how variance works. It just comes in stretches. Sometimes you feel like poker's the easiest game in the world and you can't lose. And sometimes you're just on the other end where you kept on, you keep on getting dealt like second best hands and it's just really hard. And instead of like 
uh, a scenario where when you're running good, you're like, oh, how can I value that my ace is on the river? When you're running bad, it's like, oh, God, now I might have to fold, right? That's a big difference. Um, and it's things like that that can uh, make someone think that they're the best player ever or the, the worst player ever. And I think in both mindsets, it's important to be objective and be realistic and not be overconfident, but also not, you know, beat yourself up too much when things are going bad. So it goes both ways, I would say. Yeah. I mean, you got to uh, have I think confidence. Through experience, yeah. Through experience, I've kind of learned to, uh, uh, you know, not have super high expectations that, you know, this is just how it's always going to be just because I felt, you know, I felt the pain right after like the biggest high. Um, yeah. So I think that, uh, that keeps me in check for sure. Just having that experience of like going on the biggest downer I've experienced right after the biggest high I've experienced. Right. You had a few, uh, six figure scores until uh runner up finish that you mentioned early in the five K at the last summer at the WSFP for just under half a million dollars. Another six figure at Venetian. We have to fast forward. Sorry. And then we get to the WPT at win in Las Vegas in December, 5,430 players. I mean, you mentioned before, you didn't know if you were ever going to make a big field run again. <laughs> Here you are yeah. again, 5,000 yeah. players later. And you, you know, you take it down for $712,000. I mean, yeah. And that was not, and it was cool because my mom actually flew in for that one. So it was the first time she'd see me play oh. poker. And it was great that she was there for that one because uh, WPT, they had like a, a pre FT show and they like everything was like jazzed out and they had like reserve seating for like my guests and stuff. It was really well done. Uh, yeah, that was just an amazing experience for sure. And to be able to watch that back and, uh, with it being streamed is just the coolest thing ever. So, you know, you got 5 million in live tournament earnings. Have you, have you treated yourself yet? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I got like a Tesla now and I, uh, but most of my money goes into, uh, well, just future buy-ins or I just invest it with my parents because they're really good with money. Actually, that was one of the, one of the agreements, uh, which I was definitely on board for. They're like, look, if you're going to do this poker thing, you have to at least be smart with your money. So you have to like come to us and let us help you with your money. I was like, all right, that definitely works with me. Right. There's no, uh, there's no built in 401k for no, the no. tournament players. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got to You got to squirrel it away while you can. Um, you know, and obviously that win came in just under the wire for the new year, which made you the GPI player of the year. Yeah, which, that was super cool. I mean, how does that feel? What does that feel to have that that sort of title? So I think mantle? during the year, I didn't think of it as much. I was kind of just playing to play. And I remember my dad, because actually I'm not only number one for the GPI, but also number one for the mid-majors. So the right. mid-majors was more of my dad's concern at the time, because I'd hit, I'd hit number one a couple times. But I kept on getting surpassed. He was like, buddy, you got to play below 20. Because at the time, I was running well, so I was playing most of the higher <laughs> stuff. And he was like, buddy, you got to start playing more 2500s and under. You got to catch up in this race. I was like, ah, yada, yeah. I was like, look, there's a 1K at the end. Maybe I'll do something of that. And he was like, all right, fine. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, my goal was like, you know, to make money. So I was trying to play as big as possible with all my tax write-offs. Um, and obviously, most of those buy-ins are 2500 and under. So he's, uh, my parents were like a little frustrated that I was skipping those events, but then mm -hmm. I eventually pulled it out for not only mid major, but also to surpass one of my best uh, poker friends, Adam Hendricks and become overall GPI uh, yeah. player of the year. Uh, yeah, that was just incredible. Um, well, speaking of the high rollers, you, d you did have a 25 K cash this year. Are you going to be playing more of those moving forward? Yeah, I think, uh, I think I'll just be playing. I'm pretty selective with the high rollers I play. I like to pick good value things. I'm not really like too much of a glory hunter dick swinger. So usually if I think the <laughs> spot is good, then I'll take it. But uh, other than that, probably just uh, chill. It's a new year, so no like tax write-offs to just like aggressively buy in yet. Um, that's usually how I approach each year. Start, right, start off right, slow right. always, just as an American, because... You know, ta get, having a losing year with like, you know, and not counting towards future winning years is just disastrous, right? 
Right, right, right. That's funny you say the dick swinging players. Like, is that how what you uh, call all the Poker Go guys? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, but like, I mean, you have to be really, really sharp and uh, really studied at all times to be competing in those kind of fields. Um, some players are are. I, I focus mostly on just uh, the value tournaments and uh, you know. I, I would say the real bread and butter money makers are like you know these mains that uh, these like mid stakes lower to mid stakes mains that like you know attract a lot of recreational players. I think those are the safer, you know, more consistent money makers. Even though the fields are bigger, so then there's more variance in that. But uh, at yeah, least, uh, and you got to travel too. Softer and traveling, traveling expenses uh, aren't great either. But um. Yeah, I'll play some of the poker go stuff just because uh, it's rake free for the first bullet, which is awesome. Carrie's super generous with everyone, which is great, and um, and it's right in my backyard, so I can just show up for my rake free bullet. And then, exactly, that, I think that's why a lot of them do it too. It's like they don't have to get on a plane to go to Oklahoma anymore; they can just <laughs> show yeah, up for in the backyard, sure. you know. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, we have some rapid fire questions to wrap things up. If you're ready to go. Let's see here. Oh, have it has anybody ever thought that you were related to Kevin's song? Uh people have mentioned that, but I actually never <laughs> had a chance to play with uh Kevin's song, but I, I, was like, I know that guy's he's, a, he's your dad? an old time legend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean I I definitely have that. Uh that him and uh Steve Song people have said. Oh Steve Song, yeah, yeah. Just yeah one yeah. left off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those two um, guys. And yeah, those two guys are obviously both uh legends, but yeah, never gotten a chance to play with either of them. But yeah, I heard their names multiple times. Uh biggest punt. Biggest punt. Uh it's funny. I would say just a, I've had a ton of like ridiculous punts, but uh I would say going from Borgata that Borgata WBT that I got sixth in in 2018, I was chip leading nine left with like 35% of the chips in play, and I ended up getting sixth. So that was probably felt like the biggest punt in the biggest spot of my life at the time. Yeah, that's a tough spot when you see that first place figure right there. Yeah, you don't I think mean, about the money until you're out, and then you're like, what was I doing? Yeah. <laughs> that ICM matters for a reason. Um, yeah. Do you play any musical instruments? I play a little piano. I can play a couple songs, but that's about okay. it. Um, what about art? Are you artistic in any other ways? Uh, I guess I was into drawing as a little kid, but uh, not really. I've always been more of a math guy. Okay. Um, what's your percentage breakdown between playing and studying for poker? Uh, nowadays it's way more playing and studying, but, uh, I guess back in the day it was probably the opposite when I didn't have as much, I was more prudent with my money cause I wanted to, you know, be prepared for when I was playing. Now that I've been around, I kind of know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I am going to hopefully try to study more. I mainly, uh, study with my, uh, one of my best poker friends, Brock Wilson, He's basically been my coach since 2019 or 20. Yeah. 2019. He's been my coach. Uh, 2018. Brock, 2019. Uh, Brock's got a ton of results himself. Yeah. yeah he's pressure. super sick. Yeah. He's, he's been good forever too. Even when I remember when we were both first coming up and in the beginning, he didn't have that many results. People thought that he was just playing bad. I was like, dude, this kid's like one of the best. He's just running bad, but people were just, you know, way too results oriented to see. Um, yeah, give him a, give him a minute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now he's just like killing it. So, what about the yeah. uh, the best swap or piece you've ever had of anybody? Uh, honestly, I haven't had that many like great swaps. Me and Brock will swap two percent, and I'll have like two percent in some of his and all of his big stuff. Um, I'll uh, I swapped out. I'll swap with Hendrix a decent amount. Um, I'd say it's been kind of even. I have been buying a little more action, so I had a uh, good, I'd like 10 ball of like some guys who like did well in the 25Ks. So like I did oh, nice. pretty well in that. Um, but nothing, nothing that really stands out when it comes to 
for the most part, most of the money I've made in poker, oh, basically all the money I've made in poker is through myself. So, <laughs> well, that's that's the way you want to have it. It would be nice yeah. if somebody came through, but you you definitely yeah, want to be the nice winner yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, what was oh, your worst? Say, oh, go ahead. Oh, I did want to say uh, one of my one of the coolest accomplishments uh, with the GPI awards is the player's toughest choice because that's kind of that's decided based on people's opinions and uh, get the opinions that people are saying on like their top three toughest enough to be nominated in the top four with some of like some some absolute killers is like. Just unreal. Uh, yeah, I'm there's getting, some like, crazy stares in that group. Yeah, yeah, especially in, uh, <laughs> for those three guys, for sure. But so yeah, wait, wait, let, hold on. Let me, let me go through the list. Let me go through this list because it's Brian Altman, who yeah, looks like a, like a crazy person at the table. Yeah. Uh, nice there's guy Steve, ever, but yeah. <laughs> Stephen Chidwick, who also looks like a crazy person yeah, when he's standing yeah. down. And Alex Foxen, who's super intimidating at the table, obviously. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and then, and then you, Stephen Song. And then me, the and I'm just going there. <laughs> but, yeah, that was really cool because you know to be voted by some of my peers and so, a lot of these guys that uh, are voting or that I play with are guys that I watched their training videos or like looked up to coming up for years. It's just cool to be you know respected yeah. amongst them too. Super cool. Uh, what was the worst job you had before poker? I never really had a job. Um, never, never I, took a. I was a math tutor at one point, and then I was doing some tutoring on the side to make money uh, while I was playing poker, just to have some kind of sta- more stable income for when I punted off at one two or whatever I decided to mm-hmm. do. Um, um, but no, never really had an like, official job. Job, uh, obviously blessed and. Not looking to start anytime soon with a <laughs> official job. What was your largest non-poker wager? Um, probably uh, when I was uh, had a horrible series at Borgata and I threw one k on black and I lost. Thank God. And then, I mean, I guess I, I might have had some bigger bets in blackjack, uh, but. Um, yeah, I remember that one because it stung. Because not only did I have a horrible trip, I was like, maybe I'll make one k back and I'm losing it. I remember the people Oof. at uh, <laughs> the roulette tables. They were like these older Asian ladies. Like, oh no, no, are you sure? I'm like, I'm sure. And I lost. Like, oh no, no, you should have done that. I'm like, I know I should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nothing like getting like a, a talking down to from a, a motherly know. figure. Like that's not what I need right now. <laughs> oh, brutal! Uh, do you have any nicknames? Uh, no, no nicknames. Uh, uh, people on the East Coast call me Steve, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, Steve. Yeah. They don't. They don't have time for Steven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too Here late. on the East Coast, we move quickly. We need. We need one. Yeah, so efficient. <laughs> um. Did you have anybody that you look like growing up? People tell you you have a doppelganger or anything like that. Uh, nah. I, mean, I went to Greenwich High School, so any Asian like K-pop guy, my friends would maybe say, but you know, <laughs> no one in particular. Yeah, they were like, "Are oh, you Kevin Song, son?" Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, definitely don't look like him. But. Yeah, <laughs> P- poker pro. Okay. Um, if you could download one skill instantly, like in the Matrix, what would you choose? Uh, understanding all languages. Oh, that'd be sick, right? Yeah. I think that'd be really cool. <laughs> Just walk through any part of town, see who's talking shit about you. Yeah, for sure. Or just like whenever, if I was like, now I'm planning to travel a little more, just being able to like, you know, instantly, uh, like just know exactly how to get around or what people are saying. I mean, languages are also one of my worst, uh, attributes for sure like i'm i was really bad at languages uh growing up so that's something i'd like to fix with a snap of finger for sure who was your celebrity crush growing up um when i was young i guess it was uh the girl from crouching tiger hidden dragon zhang z okay yeah uh yeah i I had a pretty big crush on her for a while (laughs) She's the, she then, was like floating in the air, right, with the sword. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, was an yeah. awesome movie. <laughs> I've seen that movie way too many times. Okay, 
Who would you pick if you could name the entertainment for the Super Bowl halftime show? Uh, You're allowed to troll it, too. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I don't really have a good answer. Uh, I would say maybe Post Malone. I, I'd say whenever I've seen him, he's done pretty well. So I feel like that's going to happen. That's going to like that's it already. Will. Yeah, it's it in the cards. Will, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's a he's a big deal. All right. Um, what is your most prized possession? Prized possession. Uh, yeah, I don't really have one. I uh, I'd say at this point, my car, maybe. <laughs> okay. The te- I, I got I got the uh, the model. X? Yeah, I got the Model X, where the doors open, you know, like, they oh, open the suicide uh, style? Not normally. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, the, like, kind of, the wings, right? Yeah, I yeah. always wondered that, so, yeah. Like a DeLorean. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's awesome. And I get to, like, open it with my phone, too, it's sick, I never even had to touch, like, open a car door myself or close it myself, it's sick. How often do you use the self-driving? I need to figure that out still. I, I just got my car recently. I've been traveling so much that I haven't actually gotten to drive it, drive it that much. But I should like look up a whole YouTube tutorial and do that soon. I, I was watching a video of this lady who fell asleep in her car on the highway like while it was taking her wherever I guess she had to go. And I was like, how do you have that much trust in a car to fall yeah, asleep? Yeah, I don't know if I would, I would have that much faith. But I don't know. We'll see. If te- the technology is like incredible now. So who knows, right? I would still want somebody up front pretending. Yeah, bef- before I can fall much. asleep. I, I, definitely not sleeping at the wheel. That's for sure. Even if you, even if you just put a fake robot in the driver's seat. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's then other people feel safer too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't. I don't even need you to like be, be human. Just be. Just, yeah. just don't be the just car. Just a figure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that too. Hilarious. Anyway, um, are you superstitious at all? I don't update my stacks unless it's on break. Wait, wait, what does that mean, update your stacks? So, like, you know how, like, when typically when people are doing well, they'll text their friends, oh, I have, like, eight. Oh, yeah, right, 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 right. Right. I, I don't do that unless it's break. So all my friends are always like, wow, you always, like, when I'm doing well in turns, like, wow, you're always upswing. It's like, no, it's like a ton of swings. It's just ha- it happens to be on break that I have more chips than I did the last break, you know? But, yeah, uh, which if you're still in the tournament is possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also, uh, I always just got the sense that like nothing good comes from it. Like when you up, you're like 1.3 mil. Like say you start with 300k and break, you get up to 1.3 mil. And you're like 1.3 mil, and then you're down to 900k. And we're like, well, what happens in the 400k, right? Yeah. You know? uh, it just like you're like setting yourself up for disappointment. I feel like when you're uh, updating, and then like other people are wondering what you have too, right? Okay, so you're not doing it because you think it's bad luck or anything. Well, I, that too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For my mental end, because I think it's bad luck, because whenever I do update, things go horribly wrong, so I just don't update. Got it. Do you have any phobias? Uh, no, not nothing in particular. Okay. Do you collect anything? Nah. Squash rackets? <laughs> no. None of that. <laughs> Everything goes to poker biomes. Yeah, throw it on the pile. Um, now I don't know if, how much cash you play. What about the longest session you've ever played? Um, I've definitely done twenty-four hour sessions, probably like thirty-six hours in like Twin Rivers when I had like no money, and then obviously I lost it all. <laughs> but yeah, that's a lot of time to spend at Twin Rivers. Yeah, a lot of coffee <laughs> too. Um, uh, do you like telling people you're a professional poker player? Uh, I'm basically indifferent. I think most people that I meet in life, that's kind of, uh, they're connected to poker in some way. Um, but, uh, yeah, usually, I mean, if someone asks, I'll say what I do, but I, I'm not, uh, quick to advertise it with, uh, right, right, right. If you go home for a holiday party, and you know, one of your parents' friends is like, oh, Steven, so what do you do? Are you just oh, like? Oh, well, they oh. all they all know. Okay. Um, like, and my parents are always bragging about me too. So, and actually, it's funny. My dad's friends are always following me too because 
they play poker too. So they're always following me and like asking me hand histories and so. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you have a nemesis or somebody you can't beat at the table? Just somebody who's always held over you? Uh, honestly, no. I I think I've held held over most people. So <laughs> I like to joke that I, like versus me, like they can't win versus me. <laughs> <laughs> or like versus, like whenever I'm I have a hand versus them, I just always have a better hand, you know. Right. Um, well, that's the way to have it. Yeah, when it's, you're running uh, good, that's gonna happen a lot. Yeah. Any near death experiences? Uh, no, not that I can remember. I I usually keep it pretty tame. I'm pretty cautious when it comes to that stuff. <laughs> um, biggest pet peeve at the table? Biggest pet peeve. Um, when people aren't paying attention and they're slowing the game down. And uh, do you have a yeah. And do you have a bold prediction for poker's future? Uh, honestly, I think poker uh, is kind of booming. I think COVID really helps grow poker, uh, especially with the younger crowd. And I think uh, people are seeing more potential in making money. And I, it's going to make our job harder, but it's going to add you know, more fire to the community for sure. I think growth is always a good thing in any community. Um, I think COVID really did... Uh, did a good job growing the game just because people had nothing to do and they just got into, you know, focus on something easy to get into. And now seeing a lot of new faces who just came up during COVID, it's really cool. I thought that our group, like our group was the youngest, uh, like crew kind of like coming up for a long time. And now, uh, there's all these new young faces. Yeah. It's interesting. There's no, so, there's not as much doom as, and gloom, you know, uh, prophecies as there was before the pandemic i guess that was oh, yeah, the, sil- yeah. the silver lining of you know <laughs> the disease <laughs> but yeah uh, but uh, okay yeah, no like ton of ton of new uh money and new blood for sure uh definitely spices things up and makes it interesting um the um yeah. and the we end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator okay all right here we go do you like superhero movies, and what is your favorite superhero? Yes, I love the Marvel Avengers series. It's, I think it's uh, the best series. I'm actually, I need to convince my girlfriend to uh, <laughs> watch all of them. She still won't. But oh, um, she's in the background listening. Listen, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I have my AirPods on, but she can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but the Marvel series for sure. I think uh, Avengers Endgame was just beautifully done. Uh, that was superhero? the most satisfying movie I think I've watched. Oh my it. god, yeah, for sure. When they're all coming out of the the portals, it's just unreal. And then, but it's like, one of those things like that everything's yeah. coming together and all the work that they've done through the years of building all these different stories and timelines, and they're all coming together and. Uh, to face off for Thanos, like the greatest uh, villain of all time. Right, but it's not satisfying unless you put in the 600 hours required beforehand <laughs> to watch no, for all, sure. the, to all watch the previous every movie movies. And then so really, yeah. I don't blame your girlfriend if she says no. That's a big mm-hmm. investment. A big investment. That is a, that is a long time investment for sure. <laughs> we got nothing of a time. We'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Awesome. Anyway, Steven, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing the stories. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. That's it. That's the show. Thank you once again to Steven for coming on and sharing the stories. You can find him on the circuit, probably, playing any and everything with a decent-sized buy-in. Or you can find him on Twitter, much easier, at SongSteven11. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at CardPlayerMedia or at Poker underscore Stories. Be sure to subscribe, like, review, and all those other good things. And then when you're done with that, head on over to CardPlayer.com to receive a free digital subscription to CardPlayer Magazine. Until next time, thanks for listening.